Good evening, and uh, welcome to SciArc's Student Design Forum Lecture Series for the spring of 1987. Tonight's speaker, which is the first in the series, is Professor J.B. Jackson from the University of New Mexico. <clears throat> Professor Jackson's long and illustrious career has been an inspiration to everyone who thinks seriously about the form and origin of our American landscape. His pioneering work on the American vernacular in such books as The American Landscape and the Necessity for Ruins reveal again and again his keen observation and his powerful insight. Professor Jackson has taught us the critical importance of examining precisely those aspects of our culture that are commonly considered to be of no relevance. The suburban garage, the roadside historic attraction, the backyard, these things are revealed in his work as fundamental expressions of American thought, lifestyles, and beliefs. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Davy Jackson. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I just flew in from Albuquerque about three hours ago. You'll be interested to know that the round trip flight from Albuquerque to Los Angeles and back is $50. How about this? Isn't that amazing? Uh, I'm somewhat apprehensive to be talking to a group of architects and architectural students, particularly connected with them institution that's as far advanced as this one is, uh, because I have dropped out of the academic world in the last four or five years, and I live in seclusion outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, if I do anything that's productive, it's uh, either trying to establish a better irrigation system on my piece of property, or working very slowly on a book on American vernacular architecture, vernacular houses, which Rice University has commissioned from me. And I am very much absorbed in the topic, as you will find out, uh, but I've not made really any advance in it. I don't know what it's all about, and I'm trying to. So you'll find here that what I'm talking about is, is almost a confession of my floundering and of my uncertainty but of the way that I think that one has to go in order to understand vernacular architecture. So if you'll be patient with me, I will just give you an autobiographical approach to this subject and what I think one should be doing in the way of studying vernacular architecture. And I've not even reached the point of defining what vernacular means. But when I dropped out of uh, teaching several years ago, um, I had free time to stay at home, which is what I want to do instead of traveling around. And I thought I'd devote that time to finding out about the houses of New Mexico, where I live. I've lived there for more than 50 years, and I know the state very well. So I was looking forward to exploring it once again to refresh my memory and to get some idea about the New Mexico house type. Uh, as some of you know, perhaps most of you know, New Mexico is very rich in house types. That is to say, different types of dwelling, uh, either ethnic background or historical or geographical or construction. But we have a great variety, more, I think, than any other state in the Union New Mexico has. We're a very poor state, but we do have a very rich history and we have a very rich background in domestic architecture. And we have Pueblo Indian house types, which date back to the 9th century AD, and then we have Navajo, which dates from the 15th century. There's Spanish American dating from the 16th and 17th century, Anglo American, and it makes for a very rich landscape in one sense of the word. It's a very varied landscape. In other words. And uh, the remarkable part of this, and then we come up to date with, the, with the trailers and mobile homes, so that we have a great variety, more so, as I say, than any other part of the United States. 
And one of the unusual features of this variety that we have is that these various types exist side by side. They're not here or there. They're all together in many communities. You can go into a community with Pueblo architecture, Spanish architecture, trailers, Navajo, Hogans, all in the same little group. This is very unusual. In addition to that the peculiarity of their being uh, all mixed together, is the fact that they're being lived in by people who built them, uh, which, again, in terms of vernacular architecture, is very unusual. Uh, when you go back east, and I dare say here in California, you have old house types, but uh, they're not usually lived in by the people who built them, nor by their descendants. They've been taken over and restored and preserved and given respectful treatment, and this is true in the east. But in New Mexico, you go into a house which is of a type, which is 7,700 years old, and they will have built it 10 years ago, and they will be able to tell you why they built it this way and how they're using it. Now, this may not seem very sensational to you, but it's a very rare thing to have happen. And when you go back east, you find that the buildings have been built for, say, three or four centuries, three centuries in any case, but they were built by somebody that has no connection with it now, and you have no inkling of how it might have been used, what its relationship to its neighbors was, how people lived in it daily, to find out, of course, but it's not the same as seeing it in action. So that the preservationists and the conservationists in architectural matters in the East is usually more concerned because of these restrictions with the building as artifact, in other words, as a form of construction, the materials used, the tools used, the ethnic background of the builders. All of this is, is very rich and very, uh, very exciting to a great many people, that you can analyze the building because of new archaeological techniques and know what tools were used, where those tools came from, where the material came from, where the designs perhaps originated. And all of this produces a study of the house as artifact, as object. Whereas New Mexico, with all its shortcomings, does give you an inkling, uh, inkling of what the house is like as it's used in daily life. If you go into a house, which is of a 7th century type, and say, why do you do it this way? What is this space for? And they will know. So to repeat, New Mexico, in this sense, is a very valuable uh, insight into domestic architecture, and this is what I've discovered in the course of my years there. Now, another characteristic of these is that uh, they are all uh, very simple houses, simple in the economic sense, that these are the houses of poor people. They're either small farmers or day laborers or, uh, or hired men or people that are working in the service sector. In other words, they work in supermarkets or gas stations, whatever it may be. And they're all very simple people. So these houses, for the most part, are very simple houses, simple in construction, simple in size, simple in cost. These people who build them or who buy them have no money to put into elaborate houses, and they don't. These are very simple, uh, rather primitive in construction because of the lack of money, for one thing. And another is that if you're in this particular type of economy, you don't know where your next job is going to be. And you may find that when this job is out, you can get another job 100 miles away. So what's the use of building a very firm house? You build a house which will last you as long as you can be there, and then you desert it. So these are some of the qualities of the New Mexico house. It's marvelous simplicity of form. Uh, I won't say flimsiness, but a fragility of construction and a temporary use of it. You know, just as important while they're being used as if they were built out of stone. But there is a quality to our domestic architecture which is temporary and modest and small. And the whole state, to a great extent, is, is full of houses of this sort. New Mexico is a, is, a, is a very poor state. When New Mexico is ranked among the 50 states, we're always 42nd or 43rd of something, whether it happens to be part of that religion or whatever it may be. We're always way down there. That's too bad. But uh, 
it, it means that we have a level of culture, as it were, uh, which is rather uniform. And so that when people come from out of state, they fall in love with New Mexico because of this simplicity and apparent ease of interpreting what they see, plus the beautiful scenery. So uh, I have every reason for wanting to see the state over and over again, and this is what I've done. So I set out to look at them. And New Mexico uh, is thought, and I'm sure many of you will agree, as being a very rich storehouse of vernacular architecture. I want to pass on what seems to be the, the conventional use of that word in terms of architecture is that something with that vernacular architecture is a house built of local materials uh, using local techniques, traditional local forms to satisfy daily use. Uh, this may not be very complete, but I think you get what I'm driving at, that it is very much a product of a simple economy, a simple social order, and these things are for daily use, so that you have dwellings which have this marvelous classical simplicity of form, and you have churches, and you have barns, and you occasionally have a, a meeting house or something. Very simple, but very traditional and quite beautiful. And architectural education has taught us to admire these forms and to pay very little attention to their use, which I think is important. In any case, that's what vernacular means. It usually means the product of of, of the local environment, whether it happens to the social environment, the economic environment, natural environment. And you do get these uh, beautiful, simple forms built of a local material with local craft to serve local needs. And this is the way we usually define vernacular. And as I say, the emphasis is on the forms. This is a, an architectural, I won't say failing, but a peculiarity to emphasize the form rather than the use of it. So uh, when I first set out uh, to explore New Mexico several years ago, uh, I was surprised, at least I was not surprised, I suppose it means something was confirmed in my mind, that uh, this uniform, rather impoverished quality of life in New Mexico and in the houses prevails throughout the state. There are some very handsome architect-designed houses in Albuquerque, which is our big city, and Santa Fe, which of course is a very fashionable place, so that you have architects working in both places. But you go through village after village, and you get off into the rural country, and you see not a sign of the big house, the great house, the house of the rich person, which has been designed by an architect for a special way of life. You just see this uniformity of domestic architecture everywhere. And this is rather impressive. And it gives you, uh, I think this is one of the qualities of New Mexico, that uh, there, is, there is very little pretentious wealth in the landscape. There is in those two places, for sure. But generally speaking, it's on a very humble level. Now, when I first came to New Mexico, which is more than 50 years ago, I had no interest in architecture of any kind. But I was drawn to the little villages that are uh, scattered throughout the uh, state, not only in the mountains, which many of you are familiar with, but in the, the range country, and the ranch country. Uh, you go off and you find a, a tiny little village of adobe houses, miles from anywhere, and rangeland all around it is empty, and there'll be a little river or something that flows through it uh, with enormous cottonwoods on either side of the river. And that water irrigates the corn field, the uh, alfalfa field, the chili field. And there's a little village of, of adobe houses. And all of these people that live in these villages, I'm talking in terms of 50 years ago now, that live in these villages are small-scale farmers. In other words, they have perhaps five or six acres of land that they're putting into onions and chili and stuff. And the rest of their livelihood comes from, from having cattle or sheep. And they live in little adobe houses, which are one story. And those that I'm familiar with, though I know there are other kinds, uh, usually have a pitched roof, which is covered with skin. And these roofs glitter in a wonderful blue way when the sun shines on them. The houses themselves are dark brown, 
and they have white trim around the doors and the windows. And they have absolutely no ornament at all. Just white trim windows, white doors, dark brown background. Very handsome, very austere, and very simple, of course. And they usually are linked together. They're all next to each other, right? Just a pose. And so that they form, as they come around, they'll form a three sides of a plaza or a square. And this is quite beautiful in itself, even though there's no attempt at art here at all, and it's dirty and it's disorderly. But you have these courtyards, and you have these houses around it, so that the town has this village, has this sort of urban quality of squares and rows of buildings. And the houses usually have very little furniture in them. They're too poor to have anything. And they don't, they don't spend much time in them, actually. They're out during the day. The man gets up in the morning, he gets up and gets on his horse, and he goes out, again, you remember I'm talking about that. He goes out to see how his fields are doing, perhaps do a little irrigation. And he goes off to see how his cows are doing on the community range. And then he goes around to look for what resources he could possibly scavenge. There may be firewood here. Or there may be a stray steer here that nobody there may be somebody who tells him there's a job on such and such a ranch, they're going to put up some hay next week, or else they're going to build another fence, maybe you can get that job. So that life is a, a, a series of exploring of the environment to find these opportunities, and then there's no system to it. But this is what life is, is looking for a little job and coming home at the end of the day. You never go into town because the roads are so awful, and in those days people didn't have cars the way they have them now. So that she was going into town was a very rare event. And the big event was going to church, a little adobe church. And uh, everybody in the village would go to church. And then in the afternoon, all the young men uh, would get on their horses and gallop up and down the main street. And they'd all dress up in all their finery and they'd gallop up and down. Up and, down. and then there would be a rodeo in the fall, a little amateur rodeo, uh, very attractive to see. And that was it. And uh, at about Nine o'clock at night, the last kerosene lamp would be extinguished. And not a sound, not a movement. You just hear these coyotes talking in the background, as they're off in the rain. And this whole life, as I saw as a young man, very austere, very restricted, very impoverished. Uh, but it had an extraordinary dignity to it, an extraordinary uh, classical quality, Spanish language, as some of you probably know, Spanish language, Spanish manners, a landscape which is full of these beautiful monumental forms without details, just enormous mountains without a tree on them. All of this gives the whole landscape uh, a monumental classical quality that uh, you fall in love with. And as soon as I saw it as a young man, I thought I never want to see this change. And I had no business saying that because it was impoverished and they were in the warm and they were ignorant and everything else. But it was beautiful to see it. Well, to come back to this search that I made, uh, I started out uh, some time ago to, re to, to see these places again. I'd seen them many times in the meanwhile, of course, but I wanted to see them once more with the idea of the naked architecture. Perhaps if I showed you uh, some very inadequate slides of uh, those early days, uh, they will give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about, in other words, the change is taking place. So let me just show you four slides. Am I to press a button here and it's going to shine a picture? Let me see. All right. No, no, not that fast. Just one at a time. Just one at a time, please. No, let's start with the first one. Let's start with the first one. No, that's not it. If we can start with the first one, that'll be fine. No? There you are. Now, this is a, a typical, I hate to say that, but it was one time would have been a typical New Mexico house. Adobe bricks, and you can see what's left of the white trim, and you can see the, 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 the peak roof, the pitch roof. And this is what one would have found in, uh, in little compounds, in little plaza. Let's see if we can get that. 
This is, uh, would be, uh, there's, this is, there's no urban form here, it just happens. In other words, that house there is a corner. This one here will perhaps be a corner, and there'll be another corner over here. So that this is the kind of house that one would have, and it builds up a little plaza, and sometimes there's a, a, a load of firewood in the front, maybe there's a fountain, I mean, a, a well, something that uh, is a community property, and these would perhaps all be belong to members of the same family, the grandmother, grandfather, and then the children, and the grandchildren, and the various families that come after that, so that you have a sort of a family compound. This is a very attractive system without being particularly sociable because every house is separated from every other house. Nevertheless, this is what I'm talking about when you have that plaza arrangement of these vernacular houses. Okay, let's get another one. This is what happens eventually. Uh, this was a little town uh, called Lucero, which is a family name. And it was a charming town when I first saw it, uh, of plazas and uh, the buildings were, uh, there was a church in the middle and there was a plaza. Then as the families move out, or as they die off, the buildings were abandoned and then they turned into stables, and after being stables, they're warehouses, the storehouses, and then they just allowed to collapse. So this is what would be left of a village, which as I say, in my youth was, I won't say flourishing, but it was still there. And you come back uh, 30, 40 years later, and it's collapsed. But this is what New Mexico is full of, these villages which have been deserted, that's one time they left. The church is still there, and they'll have a service once a month or once every two months. And that's about all there is left. It's a tragic landscape in many ways. Let me show you some more of that old dimension. Now this is a row of buildings which one occasionally finds in a village, but you see this has a very un-Anglo-American quality. Uh, just one little house after another. There's a rather nice urban quality there. This is what one used to have in New Mexico. This is some little village with no great complaint. And you see the windows are boarded up. And here's another one. That's another little New Mexico village which survives from the old days. I think this next one will probably be the last. Yes, it is. That's not to be seen right now. What do I do? How do I stop them? How do I stop the light? What, push it back? Okay, no, that's not it, I don't want any pictures. All right. Anyhow, after uh, falling in love with these villages, and with the people too, I may say, uh, I thought that it would never change, it certainly shouldn't change. But then, as I say, 50 years is a respectable length of time. So when you set out again at the end of 50 years to look for what you had once enjoy it and fall in love with you find yourself in for a good many uh, disillusionments. And one of the disillusionments, I suppose it's sort of the fundamental disillusionment, was that uh, uh, farming and ranching was no longer the source of income. There was none of this life that went with having a little corral in the back with a few sheep in there and a cow and a saddle horse and going out to the rain. That's through it pretty much. There's some people who do it, but they, they don't make much of a living on it. And what you have now are villages, or at least what I discovered, that the villages uh, still were there, uh, but the men were working at uh, odd jobs or in the service sector uh, in town someplace. And now they all had cars. I'm trying to find the right page here. They have cars. And uh, they think nothing of commuting 30 or 40 miles a day for a very low paying job. They're not skilled people, they're not highly educated people. And so that they go for 30 or 40 miles and they're making $4 an hour, whatever it may be. So that every house has several cars. You see, you see, so it's a dilapidated condition. And always one of them is a pickup, and then they go to work in the pickup. And so this has given a totally new uh, appearance to the village. Uh, the roads are now paved so that they can go to jobs in this uh, some business. The children are now taken by school bus to town, and then they come back in the afternoon, the school bus lets them out, and uh, they run up the street, and screaming and yelling and laughing, and they all got bright colored clothes, and it gives the vitality that the town never had before. 
and cars are everywhere. There are three or four cars outside of every house. And um, outside of the bar and outside of the convenience store and off in the fields and in the backyard, in the driveways and in the front yard, they're all everywhere, the cars. And, and the, the, the hoods are raised and they look as if they're about to devour the young men that are working on the carburetor and, and, and the, the radio is playing Spanish music all the time. And it, it's, uh, they're still just as poor as they were before. Uh, but there is more vitality, and I'm very glad of that. But um, what I was not prepared for, and that was the fact that of those old houses, which was what I was out there to study, uh, there many of them were being abandoned or had been torn down or dissolved because adobe a doll, a dissolved. It's, that, you know, it's nothing like as durable as brick, brick or plain so that the houses, the old houses, were, were, were disappearing. And what was taking their place were cinder block houses, cement block houses, frame houses, uh, and houses that were trucked in. We've had a good many army installations in New Mexico, and then the houses come on the market, and they buy them and bring them out to the village. So you have a, a very heterogeneous collection of houses there. And then, in addition to this, you have a great many of the men in the village, because of these jobs that they have, are in construction, if you're familiar with that phrase. It simply means you work as a carpenter or whatever, but in construction is a phrase that's all you. What's your son doing? He's in construction. Well, being in construction means that they can build a house better than their parents could. And they know about new materials and new techniques, and they know how to use power tools. So they built themselves, in many cases, nice little houses. And you have this assortment now of, of one or two of the old houses left, and then some frame houses that the men themselves have built, some houses that have been here, some houses in cinder block. There's a heterogeneous quality, but to one who knows them, you see that they're all similar. They all harbor the same type of life. And unfortunately, this uh, plaza deal is out. Uh, it doesn't suit the present where building and families are no longer quite so, so cohesive, so that you have separate houses rather than the little, the little compounds, the little houses, which to my mind, and which I think is based on fact, represented the extended family, all knowing each other and all undoubtedly bothering each other, but they did form a group. Whereas now you have people living separately as if they were friendly but self-sufficient neighbors, they're not in each other's hair quite so much. But the road is where they want to build their houses now. They've got their cars, and so instead of the compound, they're building the road. But this is uh, what, uh, this is uh, almost, uh, almost my thesis is here, is that uh, much of this new housing in rural New Mexico, and in urban New Mexico too, for that matter, and in urban USA, was of trailers, of, uh, what uh, in polite terms called mobile homes, but trailers is what people call them who live in them, and what I call them. So you have an enormous number of trailers coming in, and you, as a matter of fact, in some of these little New Mexico villages, they outnumber conventional houses, such as uh, Adobe or cement block or frame, so that the tourist who drives through there to show him rural New Mexico cries out with delight, look, there's an Adobe house, and the whole thing is one time and there's just one little other old house left, and all the rest of them are new houses, including trailers. And so when I saw these trailers there, and bear in mind, I had this sort of an emotional commitment to New Mexico, it didn't if I was being particularly objective about it. Uh, but uh, I, I saw these villages, which in my mind were still social entities, with trailers instead of adobe houses, and I began to think about this definition of of vernaculars being traditional forms, traditional materials, traditional tools, and all this stuff. And was this still a valid definition? Well, I, I'm not presuming to say that it isn't valid. I can only say that it is valid in the next one. The trailer for people of my generation first came on the scene during World War II and in the years afterwards. That was when it was used for emergency housing in 
army installations and, uh, and uh, munitions industries and places like that. And uh, they were, you see hundreds of them gathered around, usually at some sort of formation, around army posts or around uh, airports or whatever it might be. And, and uh, then they began to invade universities when they were served as uh, housing for a married students. And uh, you looked at them and you, you, know, you had patriotic thoughts about how wonderful it was that people were doing these things. But it never occurred to you that they were going to last. And so you didn't care whether they looked well or not. They didn't. They were very ugly. But they were temporary. They were wartime efforts. So forget it. And as actually is what happened. They all disappeared. But comes another decade or another generation. Here's the tape trailer is back. Many more than there were before, now called mobile homes by the industry, much larger, much more comfortable, much more expensive, and you find them uh, all over the USA. I don't have to tell you about that. And uh, uh, 13 million Americans are supposed to be living in trailers now. And most of them are blue collar families, young blue collar couples with their children. And uh, they call trailers home. Uh, but as you all know, and you may very well share this sentiment, there's a very strong prejudice against trailers in the United States. And architectural historians who have learned to accept the bungalow and the split ranch level and the uh, A-frame still cannot recognize that the trailer is a form of dwelling. It's a thing they're not discussing. You look at some of the architectural history to find out what the trailer is mentioned. And in addition to this, of course, you have property owners who don't want to have a trailer in their neighborhood and who criticize the type of family that lives in the trailers. And then you have style-conscious communities that so legislate or so rule that trailers occupy a very inconspicuous part of the, of the, of the environment. The scene. And then you have sociologists who study uh, trailer courts and comment on the terrible conformity among the trailer inhabitants and how tyrannical the trailer court manager is. You uh, report that the trailer is being attacked on all sides. Uh, nobody likes them. But it's one thing to see the trailer as part of a regimented mass of houses. In other words, row on row after row. I have some pictures and I'll show them in just a minute. Uh, when you see trailers that way, uh, you're not moved by it, and you have no compunction in criticizing it. And it's a, quite another thing when you see them individually. This trailer is in the midst of other kinds of houses, and, uh, and it's in the fabric of some of the most conservative, some of the oldest and most conservative communities in the United States that trailer has been admitted. And that is to say it's been admitted among the Pueblo Indians, among the Navajo Indians and among the Spanish men, right in the so, And there's no question of disguising them, no question of hiding them, no question of keeping them out. On the contrary, they occupy sometimes their best locations in the heart of the town. So when you see trailers, as I saw it, as many have seen them, as integrated into the community, you have to give them a second thought. No matter what your concern is with supporting uh, traditional forms and vernacular and adobe or whatever, you have simply got to think about them. So uh, I have thought about them. And uh, I rehearse in my own mind the indictment of the trailer, which all of you are familiar with and which I was brought up on, uh, that uh, the educated public and the architects and the urban planners uh, all formulated this indictment, and it is part aesthetic, it is part social, and it has just the right touch of compassion in it for those who are unfortunate people that live in trailers, so that you can't criticize it yourself. And so that you start out with saying that the trailer is an industrial product, mass produced and low cost and negotiable and expendable. It comes out of a factory and appears at the site ready for occupancy. It thus bypasses the craftsman and architect, and it leaves the owner or consumer 
no field for self-expression or even a choice in the arrangement of the interior or the exterior of the, of the, of the trailer. Some trailers even come fully furnished, which is the ultimate indignity. Secondly, the trailer, coming as it does from some remote industrial plant, ignores in its design all local architectural styles and all local environmental constraints. And this is, I, I'm not denying any of the truth of any of these, of any of this indictment. And I do know that where I am, which is in a terra incognita, in the eyes of a great many retailers, should we say, New Mexico, send them out, whatever you have. And they keep sending us, they send us things, they send us trailers, which poor New Mexicans buy, and these trailers are meant for Alabama or Louisiana or Florida, and here we are in a zone where the thermometer drops to 30 below. So this is one of the failings of the trailer. They have to be no attention to environmental factors. You have to go, and I think I have a slide here. You have to go far north to buy the kind of trailer that is Anyhow, this is one of the drawbacks of the, of the trailer. It has absolutely no regard for local tradition, architecturally, nor for the, for the climate. And then its shape and its uh, box-like appearance make any composition of trailers impossible. Uh, and no matter how this uh, cited in relation to one another, nothing resembling a, 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 a traditional community can ever emerge from a, from a collection of them. And despite its outstanding ugliness, the average trailer is quite small and cramped, and about two-thirds of the size of the minimal house and because it's long and narrow, it cannot possibly provide a satisfactory set of rooms for family. Uh, though the trailer is often successfully used as an office or a store or even a schoolroom, its inflexibility, its limited variety of spaces mean that it can never be autonomous, can never be a self-contained home. On the contrary, Almost from the first day of occupancy, it begins to spill its contents and its occupants out into its immediate surroundings. And as time goes on, it becomes increasingly dependent on the spaces and services provided by the community. And yet its potential mobility, its frequent changes in occupants and its ownership, prevent it from being integrated into its surroundings. Finally, the indictment concludes, it is a flimsy construction. It is easily destroyed by fire or toppled by a high wind. Literally as well as figuratively, the trailer has no real attachment to place. Now, I think most of us uh, would agree with this indictment here. We wouldn't say that it was final, but we would say that these points were well taken. And I think we could even add to this list of, of, of the shortcomings. But I have the uneasy feeling that from the point of view of those who live in the trailer, uh, these criticisms miss their mark. Now I'm trying to approach what I consider a definition of vernacular architecture, which will include the trade. I learned from the villagers as I went around uh, that who had moved into trailers, they'd abandoned their old adobe house, like the fat village. <laughs> well, they'd abandoned their adobe house and it moved into a trailer, and they were quite happy. And they were quite aware that the trailer was much too small for the number of children they had and for their belongings, and that the arrangement of rooms is awkward. Any of you who've been in trailers know that it's, a, it's like a sleeping car. I mean, it is, it isn't suited to the domestic life, really. And uh, that insulation is often very poor. But nevertheless, they are also aware of, of the, uh, advantages of the trailer, and perhaps you're aware of it, but I don't think most people are. And the most important of these, of course, of the trailer is that it is cheap. It's cheap to buy, and it's easy to buy. There's none of the negotiating with real estate and all of that. You just go out and buy it the way you would buy a car or something. And they naturally regretted leaving the old adobe house as its association, but it was a delight to move into a brand new home which was clean and never been used. Now, it is my belief, 
which is based entirely on experience, but a somewhat lengthy experience, that at least one third of all Americans have never owned, even driven a new car. In other words, they've all had secondhand cars. And they'd like very much to have this experience of owning and driving a new car. And that's why there's spray cans which produce the smell, whatever it may be, identified with the new car. You can, you can buy them. And a new trailer has the, the same appeal, stickers on the window, booklets of instruction, and that indefinable smell of newness. It takes a little time to realize that it is also comfortable and convenient with all its miniaturized fixtures and appliances, and maintenance proves to be child's play. The fact that it looks like all the other trailers in the village is, if anything, reassuring. It indicates that Joyce was a popular one. <laughs> but the most welcome feature of trailer living is that it does not entail any abrupt change in the traditional domestic routine. It means no new responsibility, no change in relationships, no new identity. The man in the family can leave home early in the morning without having to chop wood or to feed the livestock and spend the day reconnoitering the neighborhood for a job or making contacts. With fewer domestic chores, the wife is free to venture into the outside world. And at the same time, there's always the possibility of moving. Trailers, like automobiles, are not hard to trade or sell. If a better job becomes available somewhere else, it can be at least considered. It also seems as if, it almost seems as if those deficiencies noted by the critics of the trailer, its lack of individuality, its dependence on its surroundings, its functional incompleteness, were precisely what made it an attraction and useful to its occupants. Or to put it in another way, the trailer and other types of low-cost, mass-produced, working-class housing, should we say vernacular, are generally evaluated by their occupants in terms of how well they respond to the prevailing social and economic order. The criticisms of the trailer that I have enumerated express a very different point of view. They are based on the assumption that there is such a thing as a standard dwelling, and even a minimum standard dwelling. There is such a thing in the minds of most of us. People cannot live except under these conditions. There is a minimum standard. A dwelling which incorporates those qualities which Vitruvius, 2,000 years ago, said were essential to any work of architecture. Firmness, commodity, and delight. He was thinking of temples and palaces and luxurious country houses, but in a more democratic vein, we associate them with an example of domestic architecture. In modern terms, these mean these three adjectives. Uh, mean solid construction, an efficient plan, and a pleasing exterior. And of course, in all three respects, the trailer and much of low-cost housing are deficient. It is quite true that a well-built, well-designed, spacious house can take a large amount of capital, and that the owner is committed to a certain lifestyle and to certain relationships and obligations for many years in the future. The house and its maintenance can become a heavy burden but in an agricultural society where change is slow and traditions are valued, these constraints are not much felt. Immobility and a reduced income are a small price to pay for a house where the family can be protected and which symbolizes status. That is one reason why even a small, hard-working farmer builds a large and substantial home. He counts on perpetuating ancient relationships with an unchanging natural environment and with old neighbors. He thinks of his property as forever self-sufficient and secure. Why not build a solid house that will serve as a homestead for many generations? But that is part of the past. I mean, it, we all know that this particular type of landscape, which is what we are talking about, is a thing of the past, and that type of house is no longer suitable. And this is even true in New Mexico, which is the, the most elementary types of agricultural landscape. And families now realize that they have to live by adjusting or trying to adjust to an unpredictable economic environment where new human relationships are more important than before. Change impinges on every home and in remote and impoverished regions where they do not impinge, 
people move out to where they do. This dependency on the outside world, this sense of incompleteness, of needing an almost daily infusion of energy, is no new thing to the vernacular house. And as far, far as New Mexico and many other parts of America are concerned, it was and still is a basic characteristic of the type. The Vitruvian house, in its search for autonomy, fulfills as many functions as it can, and not only preserves the family past, but, proper, but prepares for the future. So I'm talking about the Vitruvian house as representing the opposite of the, of the vernacular, and I, perhaps I shouldn't be using that phrase, but I've got stuff with it. The Vitruvian, the Vitruvian house is what I think is the ideal of middle-class America, and upper-class America, and maybe of all of America, but it's only achieved by a small The Vitruvian house, in its search for autonomy, in other words, being self-contained and having everything within it, the past, the future, several generations, a tremendous quantity of rooms for special function, all of these things are incorporated in a self-contained autonomous unit, autonomous organization space. And this is a tradition which is very old, though not as old as we might think. I think if you went back to the 16th century, you'd find that it was then very novel to build a house of stone that was going to last for general generations. It was that as good as it would. The French geographer, Albert de Montjean, defined the typical French farmstead he was writing about 1920 as an agricultural implement in that it accommodated tools, animals, crops, their processing and storage, as well as a labor force, meaning the family, all under one roof. Now there's, there's, an, autonomous, there's an autonomous unit for it. Everybody, all the work, everything, all under one roof. And this, he was not being poetic. He thought that these were a very sordid, very oppressive organizations, but there they were. This is the French farm that a thoroughly autonomous unit. But the vernacular house, which is a house which is not self-sufficient, which doesn't have many acres, but which is living by this hand to mouth going out looking for jobs or working for somebody else. The vernacular house, whether rural or urban, surrenders many functions to the community. Translated into spatial terms, this means that many of our daily needs, cultural as well as material, are satisfied in such public semi-public places as the church, the school, the village common, the village mill, the tavern, and the street. This is still the case, but as my experience in these villages has suggested, one particular space, now I'm up to date, I've been talking about the villages that I remembered as sort of a romantic age from my youth, and then those that I rediscovered two or three years ago, and from what I rediscovered, I now begin to see what I think the true vernacular now is. One particular space has evolved to become by far the most versatile and important alternative to the dwelling. Just to repeat myself, I said that the, valley, the vernacular dwelling is incomplete. It needs some outside space to feed it and keep it going. And in an agricultural community, it would have been the village common. It would have been the forest, it would have been hunting, whatever it might have been. Now, we don't have that, we have a different kind of community. What is the space which supplements the house? This house, the street, is, this, is the answer. The street is the, is, the, is the complement of the house. Now let me show you, while I have the situation somewhat under control, some of the pictures that I had here. And I was talking about the, the new, new, new Mexico village which had given up agriculture and which was going back, or at least was thinking in terms of odd jobs and service jobs. So here is the prototypal house with a, with a pickup in front of it. That's the important thing. The boy had just finished painting it, which was quite an old car, and he painted it that orange, and he was very pleased with it. This is uh, just a typical of uh, the way the houses are being built now. Much more comfortable than, uh, 
than the old houses were. But, and of course, it's left the traditional style totally up alone. But these are the natural houses, I feel. Well, let me give you a third picture here. Well, this is a collection of cards, and you think there was a party going on, but there isn't. There's a <laughs> <laughs> they all live there. <coughs> they all live there. And here's a little, I call them traileries, which sounds affected, but I'm trying to think out a word of a community which is composed of trailers. And you talk about, uh, well, I kind of, pottery is a place where pots are made. So a trailer would be a place with tra associated with trailers. So uh, this is a little, well, it's actually much larger than this. Nothing but trailers. And these are not in any court. They are not in any park or anything like that. Each of them owns a half acre of land, and they live an ordinary life. But it is, uh, I think, an interesting phenomenon of communities that are composed of nothing but trailers. And I'm sure there are plenty of them in California, except land is so expensive here that you can't have quite this spacious thing. But throughout New Mexico and the Southwest, you'll find plenty of these traileries. They're not picturesque. They're not uh, interesting in one sense at all. But there they are, and I find them very worth uh, observing. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. Well, now this is, uh, can you see that? Can you read that? <laughs> this, this, this is typical of the type of, uh, okay, thanks. This is what's happening in, in, uh, in the trailer world, or in the, in the vernacular world. And I think I have one other sign which indicates that. Can you see that? Uh, well, it says here, uh, it's back to damn it. Uh, yeah. Could you reverse that last slide because it indicates what's happening in the connection? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you what the sign says. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it. I'll tell you what it says. <laughs> You see, it's, it's, it's stylish to have an imported house imported from Colorado or Nebraska. That's what, that's what, that's what gives it real style. <laughs> well, anyhow, I'm, uh, I think that's the last of that set about the, the village because I'm going into the street right now, and I think that that's the last one of that. Anyhow, what is happening is, as I sort of suggested with the village, with the coming of the paved road and people having cars and school bus, uh, that the street is becoming the important uh, factor. Now, any of you who are interested in vernacular culture, vernacular architecture included, knows that everybody for the last generation has been saying Everybody's been saying that there's a strong link between street life and the vernacular, whether it happens to be music, speech, dress, 
uh, all of those things one identifies them with street life. And so that when I say that the street is the um, most important complementary space for the house, for the vernacular house, I'm not saying anything that's original. It's been said in one form or another for the last generation or so. But that's all. That the street is the source of a great deal of vernacular culture. But uh, the thing is that you've got to choose the right street. Uh, you've got to know what you're talking about. And I think that the, well, the relationship between street and house is not always the same. And that certainly can be illustrated here in LA and any other American town. There are some places where the street dominates the houses on either side, which seems to be the case in most business streets. There is the opposite way in which the houses dominate the street. You get off into Bel Air or someplace like that where the houses are expensive and the street is just subservient to them, you have a totally different relationship. And I don't think this is a subjective thing at all, that there is such a thing as the houses dominate the street and other the streets dominate the house. And also you have to realize that the street in the medieval world or in the colonial world is a different from the street now. The street in an upper class suburb is different from the street in a, a city ghetto. So you do have to choose the street. There's no just talking about street and street light unless you know what you're talking about. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Americans uh, have a very romantic view, and I don't know why, because you spend an enormous amount of time in the street, going to work or shopping, whatever it may be, but talk about street light, and they immediately have this extraordinary uh, idea that the street is a marvelous carnival with uh, uh, lots of noise and violence and ethnic behavior going on and this kind of stuff. And that's, this is not true, except that a very few streets in, in real slums, in real ghettos, we may find some of that and we don't like it because we shouldn't have it there. But we think of it as sort of a, a version of the first scene of an Italian opera with a lot of going on, terrible pictures. And this is not the way uh, the vernacular street is. There's still some of these slum streets here. But what they illustrate, it seems to me, is what a slum illustrates is the total failure of the houses to satisfy their needs. And so that the street becomes a place of refuge. And that's not healthy in any sense. So what we want is a street where the vernacular and the city, the street activity balance each other. And I think you can find that. And what has happened in America, and I speak, I won't say with authority, but with experience because I've lived here long enough, is that over the last two generations, a new kind of street has come into existence in America. A new kind of street, a new kind of street life. Street life, economically speaking, and socially speaking. And largely due to the automobile. I think we could almost say that without the automobile, we wouldn't have had anything like this. I'm not speaking of traffic, I'm speaking of the social and economic aspects of the street vitality that we have here. And this is the kind of a street that we must think about. A contemporary American street, not in a slum, not in a rich suburb, but just in sort of middle class USA, and to see what the relationship is. Now, this, as you know, of your generation know far better than I, has been very much explored and discussed and photographed by a younger generation of architectural critics and landscape critics and social critics and photographers. There's been an enormous amount of material that's come out in book form, in the form of articles, in the form of photo exhibits, photo books, on the strip and various aspects of car culture in America. And it's wonderful stuff that they've produced. And uh, I've learned from it. And I think we all learn to accept certain aspects of American street culture that we had ignored or had despised before. And I think and a tremendous amount is still coming out. And I suggest to those of you who are interested in it that the best way of keeping track of these books and magazines and stuff that are coming out about New Street Life is in what is called the News Journal of the Society for Commercial Archaeology. Are you all familiar with that? Well, it's very good. It's an outfit that's in, uh, headquartered in Vermont. And uh, they have uh, they've put out, I think, four copies of it year in which they discuss various aspects of, of uh, commercial vernacular. Uh, they've been uh, very much excited, and I think unnecessarily so, 
about the destruction of certain bus depots that had Art Deco features to them and want to keep them alive. But this is what they're interested in. And then there were several uh, roadside uh, structures in New England, which are in the shape of milk bottles, about four stories high, they advertised milk being sold on the bottom of them. And they didn't want them to destroy. They wanted them moved into the heart of Austin, where they could be a uh, source of amusement to people. But this is what the, this is what the commercial archaeology is. It, as I say, I think their preservation efforts are misguided. But I think their study of these things is very worthwhile. So if you are interested in strip strip architecture, just look over. They list books and have good writers in them. However, I wish that these, and I'm sure you're all familiar with what I'm talking about, these books that come out about uh, McDonald's, that come out about Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, 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 different types of coffee places, stuff. Uh, there have been a lot of that. Very well done, very well researched. But I wish that they had had more time to spend on the less glamorous, the more indigenous aspects of the American roadside than they had. In other words, they don't take up the place of work, they don't take up the dwelling, and they don't take up these not the right phrase, but the small little mom and pop businesses where they happen to be uh, fixing tires or whatever it may be that is part of the roadside culture just as much as, uh, as the big franchises. They've left this out completely so that we have a picture of the strip, which is quite natural, I think. The, uh, the big expensive roads, the big highways, freeways, are lined with big money establishments, big franchises, big motels, big gas stations, and the little things and the dwellings and the workplaces have been eliminated. So it, it, we, we might very well get a false idea of American roadside architecture by reading too many of these books. I think they're very good, but they sometimes get a little precious by dwelling on uh, connections with art movements of the 20s or something, which is not to the point. This is an economic social matter, not an aesthetic matter. Anyhow, they've done a great service. But if we want to see vernacular as related to the American street, don't go to the busiest strip here with a lot of franchises and motels and stuff. Go to what I consider is the best place, and that is I find myself attracted to blue-collar developments. Uh, well, there may be developments. In any case, it's the blue-collar neighborhoods uh, that uh, on off of the center. And I'm not talking, please, I'm not talking about poverty here. I'm talking about people who don't have much money, but who would never say that they were poor. They are just say that they are working class people. So we're not talking about that anything that's particularly uh, picturesque or startling in the way of poverty. I'm talking about uh, lower middle class houses and whole neighborhoods of those, which is where I think we'll find the vernacular relationship between the house and the street. The sense of incompleteness in the house turns to the street. And it is not a street with hurdy-gurdies and this kind of knifing and going on to it. It's a perfectly normal American street, but it does contain the automobile. So that's the relationship that we should, we should be interested in. And these streets are lined with all but identical one-story single-family houses. I wonder if I dare touch this thing to see if I need it. Is it a, a good? There is a trailer court. This is the one that uh, the average American, and I sh shouldn't say that because I'm one myself, but oh, trailers, God, they're so awful. And this is what they think of this kind of thing. Of course, it's an air view, which is not the normal perspective on them. But this, they think of them as being regimented things, and they are in many cases, but that's an urban aspect of it. So we mustn't think of trailers that way, nor one must we forget that each of these houses contains something that's very unique and it's different from all of its neighbors. Now here's a, well. <laughs> it's not, a, not functioning. Forward. Well, darn. If you can get it going, be fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't All right. What we're talking about is something that certainly LA is familiar with, and the rest of the USA is. 
and that is these streets with one story, single family houses, each with a built on garage, and usually that garage is used for storage, and uh, the cars are parked on the driveway leading to the garage, or on the front lawn, they're parked on the front lawn, they are. And these residential streets eventually lead to a, a commercial street with a series of one story stores, commercial outlets along it, uh, which are largely divided, devoted to meeting daily needs, daily household needs. And in one way or another, most of these uh, stores along this, these commercial streets are trying to accommodate or to, to, to convenience the, what is called the mobile consumer. I trust you're familiar with the phrase, but the mobile consumer is the consumer who does a lot of his business in the car, whether he goes to a gas station, whether he goes to a drive-in bank, whether he goes to a drive-in dry cleaners, whatever it may be. This is the mobile consumer, and a great many studies have been made as to how to divide it up to according to the length of time that he's there. If he just goes in and gets a six-pack and it takes him two minutes, okay, he's one class. If he goes in there and he spends a half an hour buying something in the store, he's in a different class. If he goes there and spends all day in an office, what? Another, you can see that it's a much more complicated thing, and yet an enormous amount of American business is dealing with the mobile consumer. And you cite buildings where the mobile consumer can see it and where he can park and where he can get in easily. So there have been books written, and I think they're very worth reading, but they're usually written for the oil companies in order to know how to choose places for gas stations. But they bring up these factors of where is a good place to build a gas station. Well, it holds true for any kind of a business that deals with the mobile consumer. So we're beginning to get that sense of dealing with the mobile consumer on our streets. Now, you're all of a generation where this is natural to think in those terms. But if you're somebody from my generation, this was not the case. You built your store on a street which was identified with other stores of the same quality and of the same type of produce. And there was no question of trying to attract somebody who was in a vehicle. They walked to your store. So that a new type of architecture has come up which deals with the mobile consumer. And this is where you see it in these residential and commercial streets in blue collar parts of town, it seems to me. That is to say, they dr providing drive-in or parking or drive-in facilities of one sort or another. And this is not a picturesque part of town. I don't want anybody to think that I'm uh, romanticizing Blue Collar USA, I'm not. Uh, it has no ethnic quality, and if it has, it's hidden. I mean, you're not aware that it's Swedish or Chinese or whatever it may be, it just looks like USA, except you see a sign that will indicate something else. There's nothing that's picturesque in that phase of it at all. But it is in this kind of a blue collar neighborhood, as I say, Los Angeles is just one mass of these, uh, where you can see how the car has been domesticated and integrated into everyday life. For instance, the spaces created for and by the automobile, parking lots, used car sales, drive-ins, and auto repair outfits with their junkyards are interspersed among the stores and houses and vacant lots. Whether by design or accident, these blue-collar residential districts seem to have evolved to accept the car not as an intruder, but as a surrogate for people. Like people, they stand in line at the drive-in bank, and they go on errands and cluster outside the supermarket. Like people, they go to work and make money and congregate in public places. Even the empty cars and pickups on the garage driveways are waiting to be worked on on the lawn, or like members of the family. There are moments when I wonder if these many front yard enterprises repairing and servicing and trading cars are not the cottage industries of the future. There are certainly, these are certainly the streets to be studied. Street life here, mostly young, is a spiller of the houses. And these garage sales, car sales, a scattering of car parks on the lawn and driveway, occupy that transitional zone between the private and public realm that every healthy vernacular street must have. Now this is the extent of my 
investigation into it because I'm obviously only at the beginning of seeing what this urban car oriented vernacular is. And it'd be foolish for me to say anything because probably would prove to be wrong. This is as far as I've gotten. But I am still haunted by the idea of how is one to define the vernacular versus what. There's, one has to be able to draw a distinction here. And I'm now realizing how complicated this matter of defining the vernacular. I don't want to uh, um, uh, kick a dead dog, but the old idea of the vernacular is being built out of local materials and responding to local, local <coughs> environmental factors seems to me so obsolete that there's no use talking about the vernacular in those terms anymore. It might have done for 17th century Virginia or something, but it's no longer the case. It's ridiculous to cling to this idea, as so many people do. They say there is no vernacular in America because we are buying our wood from Oregon or wherever it may be, and we're building it in Kentucky. How can you call it vernacular? That's not the point to me. It's this point, it's a social point, and I find that this is much more impressive when we think of the way people live and relate to each other than how they build their houses. In any case, what I have resorted to, as one does in, in, in a quandary, I can't understand the vernacular except by comparing it with something which is not vernacular. And this is what I do. And I compare it uh, with a type of house that many of you undoubtedly live in, and which is certainly common in a town or a city like Los Angeles, of well-to-do, well-built Vitruvian houses, in other words, solidly built, well-planned, spacious, with the grounds around them, and uh, made to appeal and to establish the prestige of somebody in it. I call that a Vitruvian house. I'm not making fun of it or denigrating it in any way, but this is one, one extreme is a Vitruvian house the other one is a vernacular house. The vernacular house, totally incomplete, totally temporary, totally without pretense. The other one having all of these qualities here. Now, I call it Vitruvian, and your architecture students, and perhaps you all respond to uh, this strange link that I've made here, because of something that Vitruvian said in his 10 books of architecture. And uh, he made a reference to the house of the working man Believe it or not, if you've read that book, it's surprising to find it in there. And this started me thinking along very unfamiliar lines, what uh, Vitruvius said. And he was discussing the role of the atrium in, uh, in the house. How many of you, well, I couldn't see a show of hands, but I wonder if, if in a school of this sort you have any, do you ever read any of Vitruvius? You do. Well, then perhaps you're familiar with some of his passages on the atrium, which he thinks is terribly important. And uh, this atrium, the one he's interested in, is the atrium in the house of the very rich. Those are the only ones that uh, he considers in any detail in his study. And this atrium is a magnificent, sometimes it's a courtyard. Uh, in Rome, it was a courtyard. When you get further north in Italy, it's usually a hall. And it's a magnificent room, and it's very central. And it is where the, the owner of the house, the Lord receives his guests, but he does something more than that in this room, this atrium. He also acts as magistrate and judge for his tenants. They come there with complaints, requests for help, requests for defense, requests for justice, and he stands in the atrium and decides. So the atrium has these, in, in the case of the very rich and the very powerful house, it has these two functions more than two, but at least has one which one might call the administration of justice and the other is the offering of hospitality. Well, as you go down the line, and Vitruvius gives us instances of, the next one is the big official. The official, he has a handsome atrium too. Not, not as nice as the nobleman, but it's a very handsome one. Then comes the banker, then comes the doctor or whatever, then comes the merchant whose atrium is simply a room where he displays his produce. And he, you can see there's a gradation there. And uh, uh, what is interesting about this is that even though the, the, the merchant with his bins of vegetables and things, uh, compared with the nobleman who is dispensing the law and standing for something that is uh, very noble, 
they, they all have one thing in common, and the houses have this one thing in common, is that people go to them. People go to them to ask for something, to petition for help or a bargain or advice or whatever it may be. And so the person who goes to another person's house is in a, a somewhat subordinate role. And on the other hand, the man who owns the house is in the position of being able to grant request, grant protection. He, his ego is inflated by having his house. Well, uh, he, he goes into this, and I find it a very interesting sidelight because it uh, does carry over, as some of you undoubtedly know, this idea that atrium carries over into the courtyard of the English manor house, of the great hall, and finally we use the word in the Supreme Court of the United States, a place of justice is a court, because it was a court in Rome. So that there is this whole tradition of the atrium as being involved in social responsibility. I must make a moral point here, because now when we build a house and put an atrium in, we couldn't care less about social responsibility. It is simply a place to put your umbrella when you come in. But this is what's happened with the aristocratic tradition. It no longer has a sense of social responsibility. Well, as, uh, as Vitruvius talks about these houses, he finally comes down uh, to the workman. And he says this about the worker's house. And it's just a very offhand sentence. The worker needs no atrium because nobody ever comes to him. He has to go out to them. This is a distinction he makes there. And it plays, I find it interesting because it sort of substantiates my point that we have to leave the workman's house in order to support yourself. And it also uh, is rather disconcerting in the notion it throws on hospitality. All of us here, I think, would say that hospitality is an act of friendship, of doing something for our friends and enjoying their company. But evidently, this is not the correct definition. The correct definition is, I am rich and powerful, and I offer you my protection and patronage. That's hospitality. So you do have these two distinct notions of hospitality. Well, the Roman house is built with this aristocratic notion of hospitality, with this atrium, many guest rooms, many rooms where the guests can disport themselves, their, their baths, their, their libraries, their um, gymnasiums, their banqueting halls. All of this because this is what the guest requires. And so that you have a house based on the notion of hospitality, meaning that your guests are your dependents. They are your subjects. You, you love them, you're treating them as best you can, but there's no question as who is boss here. You are the boss and you are offering hospitality and protection. So there is a notion of the house here. Uh, it's a sovereignty. And it has a magnificent, co uh, magnificent entrance way. This is what Vitruvius says. A man of taste and, and power and uh, prestige should have a noble facade so that people will know what he's like when they come to pay a call on him. And so that you do begin to have these elements of prestige and status on the entrance way. And then the guest goes in and he finds himself in the atrium and then the guest room heavy. So here you have some of these things which the uh, postmodernists are so fond of uh, as representing the power of the owner of the house. So this is one aspect of the house, of hospitality. But here we have the workman, the vernacular, who has no entrance hall. Now I ask you, and I'm not uh, saying that uh, I'm speaking necessarily accurately, but if you think of blue collar houses that you've been to, try to think not only of the way you enter the house, but of the type of hospitality that you receive. And I think you'll find that Vitruvius was mentioning something which seems to be universal, that the working man has no facilities or doesn't intend to provide facilities for guests. And that hospitality in a working class house is warm and wonderful and spontaneous but it is informal. In other words, there isn't a room for hospitality, there isn't a time for hospitality, there isn't a list of guests, there isn't a special set of china or anything else. Hospitality is a different thing in this other, in this other household. So there's one difference, I think. Now, this can be worked on. I'm not gonna detain you any longer to tell you 
what this eventually represents in this notion of hospitality. On the one hand, representing power. On the other, it means come in and be one of the family, which is what it means with the working class. Come in and join us. We're not making a special fuss for you. We haven't prepared anything for you, but come and be one of us. The other one says, you are my dependent, you are my, you are my uh, subject, I will protect you. I give you a special room, so forth and so on. So you have these two, and you have two different kinds of houses to go with it. But what I speculate, find myself speculating about, in this vernacular house, which has no living room, the living room is for the family, but it has no parlor, it has no reception room, it has no guest room, usually no dining room or anything like that. In other words, there's no setup for company. And what this indicates, because company is there all the time, what this indicates to me is a trait which uh, I, at the moment, can't substantiate, but which I think is nevertheless could be done. And that is that the vernacular way of organizing space, which says space is what you use it for. It has no inherent quality. That room is no more a dining room than it is a living room or than a bedroom. We happen to be using it. So move the furniture out, what's the difference? So that there's a vernacular way of saying space is what it is for a temporary length of time. So the whole house is organized in a way in which, yes, you sleep over there, you sleep here. This isn't your room, this isn't your room. These are the rooms that you're presently occupying. And if you go into this type of house, and I shouldn't have been in plenty of them, you'll find that this temporary use of a space is sometimes disconcerting, but it's only temporary. The garage is used for storage, as I say. Uh, the brother-in-law from out of town is sleeping in the, in the living room. Uh, they're mending the car on the front lawn. In the street, they're playing baseball. Or they're having a block party with music and dancing, or whatever it may be. A space is being used in a variety of different ways. And not selfishly, it is usually being shared with somebody else. And another thing of which uh, I can't prove to you at the moment. You don't modify it. You don't go. You don't come into this room and say, "Well, I'm sleeping here, and I'm going to move the furniture around and make it suit myself." You take it as it is. That's not a very good instance of it. If we were talking about a piece of land, you don't go in and cut down the trees and say, "I'm going to plow this up." You just take it as it is. So, vernacular space is one of the instances, one of the peculiarities of the vernacular house. The vernacular use of space. In addition to using outside spaces, it uses its internal spaces in a very different way. And uh, I'm going to stop at that, because I've talked far too long, except to say that uh, I am convinced that, this is, that there is a vernacular approach to space where it is not divided up and not so specialized, but is used for whatever purpose you want at the moment. And that this, at one time, prevailed all over our landscape, and I'm looking back two or three hundred years when, well, I can only give you instances from history which wouldn't necessarily be very vivid to you, but there was a time when the church was used in a variety of ways which we are now coming back to, I think, a little bit. But the church in medieval Europe was used for theatrical productions, for putting your sheep there when it was bad weather, for having market, for having town meetings, for having school, for giving plays, for having dances, but none of this was sacrilegious. They just succeeded each other when church came, and it did. But then this was all put an end to. But there was this use of space in a variety of different ways, which was inefficient and untidy and proletarian. And so there came a time when people, when the establishment said, all right, let's have an end to this. We're going to divide it up, and we're going to call him by his right name. And that's what happened in the Renaissance and in the 17th and 18th century. And I think it, it hit its epitome, if that's the word, or certainly it, it was at its worst, uh, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, when everything was divided up. And now I think we're getting back into something that is more vernacular. And I applaud the notion, and that's the reason I want to pursue it further. And I'm not going to say anything more, not that uh, there isn't something to be said, except I would like to um, mention three books I'm not presuming to tell people like you, uh, give you a bibliography, but there are three books that I think I owe it to the authors to, to mention. And uh, that seems to have gone. 
this. Well, I remember them. Uh, one of them is called um, Territoriality. And it was published this year by the University of Cambridge Press. And it's by an American geographer at the University of Minnesota. The Human Uses of Territoriality, in which he discusses his whole point of how land, buildings, everything are divided up. He thinks it's marvelous. I'm not so convinced of it, but he traces it as uh, from the beginning and up to the present. It's a very good book. And it certainly isn't everybody's dish, but I think you find it interesting. Another book is by, is called, and you may have uh, in your library here, called the, the Logic of Social Space. Has anybody heard of it? It's by an Englishman. He's at that, uh, uh, that architecture school in London, which is far out. I can't remember its name. Yeah, that's right. And he's a professor. Of, he's a professor of architecture. There. His name is Hillier, and this book is called the, the Logic of Social Space, in which he discusses how spaces have a way that there's certain natural laws that produce certain spaces as they are under certain constraints. Certain types of spaces. I can't begin to describe it, but he has arrived a, a, an explanation of the of the working class house, the middle class house, the aristocratic house, in their organization of space, and, uh, and of various types of community. It's a very interesting book, terribly hard reading. The third book is a book called Spaces for Activities. And it's by a young anthropologist at the University of New Mexico, a woman who uh, was in the anthropology department and I guess in archaeology and uh, she was struck by the fact that archaeologists who were going out and digging up Indian ruins in New Mexico were always assuming that when they found a fireplace that it was a place that the woman had worked and that they'd always had a kitchen there and she looked around and she found that every culture has its own way of using spaces and that there's a Navajo way of using space and of organizing it a Spanish-American, an Anglo-American, and then a prehistoric. So she's written this book describing three different ways of organizing domestic space, or four different ways, and on, based on her personal experience. And that's an interesting book, too. But there is, I think, and you will be much better informed than I am, a growing volume of, of literature and research, anthropological, sociological, somewhat arch uh, architectural, but not much, it has to come from other fields to, to get rid of this Vitruvian uh, vision that we have. Anyhow, there, there is a literature that's building up, which is describing the house not in terms of construction, not in terms of the use of the three orders or anything like that, but in terms of its use and in terms of its accessibility. In this book that I mentioned, The Sociologic of Space, he has an endless chapter devoted to the relationship between what he calls inhabitant and visitor. What I've talked about is hospitality, though he doesn't mention his hospitality, maybe a man who's come to deliver the dry cleaning or whatever it may be. But the question of accessibility of houses, what room do you go to first? Who is there? What relation is that room to other rooms? It's a fascinating book, and if anybody of you, you can find it, I suggest that you read it. So that's all I have to say. I had some, oh, here's some slides, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they've come back. I, I, I was mentioning to you that there were trailers all over the place, and I mentioned, or was about to mention, that trailers are not only next to houses, but also on top of houses. So here's a on top of houses. That's in New Mexico. I don't know why they put it there, if they did. And now these are, these are just pictures. I'll go through these hastily. Here's another trailer which has had something added on to it, you see, with the owner standing in front of it. And I find these things attractive. And here is the type of thing, and now uh, you are uh, undoubtedly much more tolerant of these things than I and my generation are. But junkyards, auto junkyards are just, you know, maybe you saw crimson when you see that. And now I realize that people go there not to scavenge, but to look for this piece of equipment from a Buick 1956. And it's an essential part of this whole automobile culture is to have the junkyards. Plus this kind of thing. 
which is used uh, auto parts. So you go into a blue collar section of town and you're likely to find junkyards, not because it's the only place for junkyards, but because those people need those junkyards. And here's the use of the street. There's one of the uses of the street, children playing in it. And here's the street itself. And each one of those houses, of course, has got its unique spatial arrangements, not that the rooms are different, but the families will be using them differently. And here again, this man, Hidya, introduces you to the different types of rooms. His point of view, uh, if you read it at all critically, is English versus our American. And I didn't realize that there were certain distinctions between the way the English would have. I mean, he talks always of a parlor and a living room, in, in, even in working class houses. I don't think that's true with us. I think we just have a living room. But in any case, it's a good book. And this is a, uh, this is a Vitruvian house. Uh, you see, they've done something to the entrance to make it not just a door, but to be a ceremony or a, a moment to go through. And you put a little fence around it to show that it's a territory. And I don't like to say this about this particular house because it's Ralph Waldo Emerson's house. But uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the case. Uh, we're, we're having a New England squire with his own little territory, his own ceremonial entrance. Now, I bet if you went in, there was a little parlor show that that's where guests went. Now, I don't know whether you can see this uh, very well, but I have a, a, a German book in four volumes on how to run the nobleman's estate. Very useful book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was uh, written in uh, 1720. Four volumes, beautiful books. And it tells you everything, how to brew beer, how to make out a will, how to forecast the weather, how to balance your budget, how to design a house with quotations from Vitruvius. And in the, one of the early chapters, it is the duty of the nobleman. Now, if you can see, the nobleman is here in the court, and all the papers. hospitality of a sort. Now let me show you the next one. And here is where he's entertaining his own friend. So there's a courtyard being used for these two classical purposes, for patronage of one sort or another. And that is the absence of that patronage is what is one of the traits of the vernacular house. Now thank you for your attention. Uh, there is a reception in room A, and uh, he will answer any questions back there. So please. If you want questions and now, it's all right. What do you want, then? No, I guess not. Go ahead.